All right, we'll get started, and of course, we'll make the uh, recording available later. Welcome, everyone, to the Endwise Community Hour. This is our second session. We did our first session a couple of weeks ago, and we're really lucky to have our Chief Education Officer, our CFP, Tanya Frias, with us, who's mm -hmm. got decades of experience. And then I'll talk from the physician perspective and my limited experience since finishing residency in 2012. Last community hour, we covered a bunch of wide ranging topics, but predominantly focused on making your written financial plan. But of course, there's a lot of interplay between things. So we thought this week, it would be nice to talk about working with a financial advisor and the expectations and best practices and some of the pricing models. I'll let Tanya take it away. I think we're going to do a similar sort of format as last time. Yeah, good to spend time with everyone. And if you couldn't make it today, of course, it's recorded. And if you have any questions afterwards, please submit them to me and I'll be happy to answer. I had a couple calls with some of the members and these calls seem to be very focused on the financial planner relationship and what to expect from it. We talked about these, the different ways that financial planners charge to deliver their services. I thought today would be a, a good time to go over what that relationship looks like, set expectations from a client and from a planner's perspective. That way the relationship can be full of value for both ends, especially for people in your unique situation. What questions do you have for me? One of the things we touched upon last week was when you're first meeting with an advisor, the types of information that you have to provide to them. So can we just do a quick recap? What would you want from the client for it to be a productive first meeting or maybe after the introductory call, the second call that you have when they're about to assess whether you're a good fit mm -hmm. to work together. But on your end, as the financial planner, you're also thinking about whether you can help these people, these yeah. physicians, residents, whoever they are, what kind of stuff do you need well, from us? There's two types of information that's needed. Obviously the quantitative information, being pretty open about your assets, income, your liabilities, all of your cash flow, money in, money out, information on your existing bank and investment accounts any insurance information that you may have, whether it be personally or through your employer, any estate planning documents, any wills or trusts or, or health proxies, proxies that you have in place. Depending on how thorough the planner is, they may ask for your tax returns as well. Information on all of your loans, whether it be student loans, mortgages, credit cards, so all of these things so they can get a full picture of your financial situation. It's a lot and it can be overwhelming and sometimes clients don't have all the information readily available for that first or second intake meeting. So it may take some time to get the information over. One thing to look out for is to ensure that the planner has a safe way for you to deliver that information. There are a lot of platforms, financial planning platforms. One is Right Capital, eMoney. They, planners use these platforms to do the analysis for a financial plan, and they all have secure portals for you to um, submit documents. They may have other ways for you to like the box and things like that for you to submit them securely. That's just the numbers. But the really important information is what you're trying to accomplish and why. There is a level of vulnerability that you may experience when you're talking to your planner. Being as honest as possible will be beneficial to both you and the planner. Um, if you feel like you haven't done what you think you should have been doing, um, a lot of clients in the past have had all kinds of feelings about the things that they haven't done. So I, I've spent a lot of time making sure that they understood that it's okay. <laughs> Planners meet you where you're at. And if you get the feeling of judgment or that the planner is not being open and making you feel comfortable, then maybe it's not the right planner for you. 
because financial planning is pretty personal. It's not just about money. Money is just numbers at the end of the day. They add value when you attach goals to them and when they get you to a certain destination or to a certain goal. It's very important that you do have a comfort level with your planner and are comfortable discussing your finances, divulging information. A lot of I have in the past worked with people or started to work with um, clients who didn't want to give me all of the information, which is okay. They didn't trust me yet, but then it meant that I couldn't give them good information. I couldn't give them good outcomes. I couldn't do good analysis because I didn't have all the information. So if you feel that you cannot do those things, then maybe either you're not ready to enter that sort of a relationship or that's just not the right planner for you. So it's obviously submitting a lot of information, personal financial information, and also divulging personal feelings and goals around your finances. You will have those conversations as well. Yeah, I think that's an awesome point and very underestimated that people that don't share the whole picture, they're not going to get the right financial plan back. And it's interesting you just said that because I was just talking to an older relative that recently who was with a big retirement company that has like advisory services and pretty mm -hmm. reasonable fee, 0.3% assets under management. But they, they had gotten so hung up on the fee, getting the best deal for their fee, that the I feel like the financial plan that ended up getting made was horrible. And the last four years of the performance has been really bad. And it's a fault of both parties. One, that, that advisory mm -hmm. services firm, one, they've had like turnover. I think this person's been with that firm for four years and their financial planners changed three times because, of, because they're employed. Yeah. Uh, planners that work on the non-brokerage side, um, but then on on the actual individual side, they withheld some very important information, or I don't know if it was lost in translation, or but they didn't take into account a large sum of money they had sitting in checking accounts doing nothing. We're talking like seven figure sum for someone in their seventies, and so this financial yeah, planner that's advisor, someone, yeah, I, I was just, I'm sorry, since Robert, I think there's a delay too. I think sometimes people think financial planners is just investments and there are mm -hmm. as happened before in the past where they don't include the money that they have in their bank account. Oh, that's the money I have in my bank account. It doesn't need to be included. All of it needs yeah. to be included in your yeah. financial plan. Yeah. And then to, to, to cut a long story short for someone in their seventies, that's still earning a good W2 income above 200, um, they, their advisor had put them in a really bond heavy portfolio that got absolutely obliterated mm. in the past 12 months while the s p 500 is up 30 percent even high yield checking accounts these days are paying four or five percent this person only made two percent on their money which is just atrocious because the financial planner was only looking at their ira and their roth ira they, they weren't even accounting for this giant sum or the fact that the person was still earning active income. If you're not presenting all the data to the person, they're going to make the assumptions and they're going to be incorrect about. And also the, the other thing I learned talking to this family member was like the, the risk tolerance conversation, I feel like didn't really happen properly. And yep. I, I don't know what a good there was an assumption way to made tease that a... out of people is. Yeah, so people, that happens a lot. Clients will sit there, or walk in there and say, I don't want to lose any money. I don't want to lose any money. I don't want to take any risk and not understanding what that means. And the planner maybe not doing a good job of explaining to them how investments work and why you would need maybe a different allocation based on their needs. Sometimes the communication is off and there are very conservative planners out there that if you say, I don't want to lose any money and I want the most conservative portfolio ever. They'll give you just that, whether or not it's in your best interest. Um, because at the end of the day, you have to agree to whatever they put you in. They don't, uh, they won't go forward with an investment portfolio that you have not approved. In the past, when I've met with clients that have started with the conversation saying that they are super conservative, they don't want to lose any money. Um, I explained to them 
how the market works and that you, the market needs time more than anything. What I would usually do is just ease them into more appropriate portfolios. Maybe you don't start 100% invested in the portfolio that would get you where you need to go. It might take some time to get folks to that optimized portfolio just because maybe they've never done it before. And the um, best, the worst thing you can do to your portfolio is sell out of fear. That does not help you. That's the biggest reason why people don't do well in their investments is because they sell at inappropriate times and it's usually driven by emotion. To prevent that, what I would do in the past was just do it over time just to get them used to market movement. So that way I'd have a higher likelihood of they staying, them staying invested in the long term. So you've now shared important quantitative information. You established some sort of risk tolerance by mutually talking about it. And hopefully you decide to move forward with this person or company. In your experience working for different organizations, what are some of the pricing models that people may encounter? Because I think for people that have never worked with a financial advisor, they don't realize like how how different it is out there for different people, different professionals getting paid. Yeah, you're saying the word financial advisor. A financial advisor could be anywhere. That doesn't necessarily mean that they're a financial planner. So you have to be very clear about the services that they actually offer. There are people who hold themselves as financial advisors and they focus mostly on investments. They're not going to go through a full financial plan to focus on the question. <laughs> I've worked at bank platforms, broker dealers, RIAs, and insurance focused firms. If you go to someone that works at like a Merrill Lynch, JP Morgan, Wells Fargo, they have a set suite of products that they can work with you with when it comes to your investments. To some extent, they can do some planning, probably not to the extent that an individual financial planner at an RIA, which just means registered investment advisory firms, those are usually independent firms. They're not attached to big organizations like JP Morgan or any banks. They have a lot more latitude when it comes to doing planning, and they also have a lot more latitude when it comes to fees. All of these big firms, they have minimums. There's a minimum you can charge a client. Those folks can charge you assets under management fees. This is probably the fee you're going to encounter the most, which means that they charge you a percentage of the assets that are invested. For example, if you have a million dollars invested with this advisor, if, if they're charging 1%, that's going to be $10,000 a year. And you don't pay that in terms of writing a check or running your card. It comes out of your investment portfolio, usually on a quarterly basis. So it'll be 1% divided by four. And you'll see that fee coming out of your account. And that's how most big firms charge fees. The other fee that you may encounter is a commission fee. If you actually have a trading account, so you're buying and selling individual securities or bonds, that is a commission type fee. It's usually very expensive now because you can trade for free on a whole bunch of platforms. Most of these firms don't want clients who trade, so they make it a bit punitive for you to open a trading account and work with a plant or an advisor to actually execute these trades for you they'll probably recommend that you go to Charles Schwab or something or Fidelity and place those trades because the, the way the fee models are set up, these AUM fees, which are annuitized, meaning that this fee is going to hit every single year until you close your account. That's steady income. Firms like that income, that'll be the pricing model that you'll probably encounter the most. If you go and work with a planner or an advisor that's talking about insurance, whether it be life insurance, disability insurance, or annuities, there are commissions paid to the advisor for those products, but you don't pay them outright. It's usually the insurance company that pays the advisor or planner. But what you would see is that you're essentially locked into these type of accounts for a certain amount of years because the insurance company has just paid this advisor money up front. 
to, to, for you to um, implement this product. And they'd like to recoup that money that they paid. And that's usually why there's a surrender schedule when it comes to annuities or even an insurance policy in some cases. If you work with someone that has their own RIA, which is again, the registered investment advisory firm, they have a lot of different ways that they can charge you. So yes, they can have the AUM model, but the model you might see the most is a flat fee for the plan itself. And this fee could range anywhere from $3,000 is probably the cheapest I've ever seen all the way up to $20,000, depending on the com complexity of your plan and your needs. Now, if you pay that, that does not include your investments. If they have an AUM model for your investments, you would not only be paying that fee for the plan, you'd also be paying a percentage um, for them to invest your assets. Now, this AUM fee could be anywhere from the lowest, Dr. Verma just mentioned was like, 0.30%, that's pretty low, all the way up to 2%. More than 2%, I don't even know how people get away with charging 2%. That's really rare. Years ago, that was normal, but that is not normal today. So anything over 2% is probably too high. And this AUN fee, it just covers the annual fee for you to have the account, right? Inside, of these accounts, let's say you have ETFs in there, so exchange traded funds, or you have mutual funds in there, those investment vehicles have their own fees internally. That could be anywhere from 0.01% to another one and a half, two percent Knowing all the fees that you're being charged is super important because it does affect performance. Most RIAs will put portfolios together that minim minimize the internal fees because obviously they're very aware of fees and don't want you to be charged exorbitant amounts of money um, and don't want your performance to be affected. But knowing what the fees inside of the fund themselves is super important. So there's the flat fee. But what happens with a flat fee is that that's it. You're going to pay this flat fee for a plan and you may get a set of services attached to that, but they're probably going to be quite limited. And if you want to continue with this planner um, for the following year, they probably have additional fees for you to work with them in the future. It may not be that same big fee, but it would be a fee that's similar to having an attorney on retainer. That's the way I like to think of those fees. Some planners will charge per hour. Um, now, if they're charging you per hour, you're gonna be thinking about every hour that this person is spending with you because that fee is about to get higher and higher. I usually don't recommend that you work with a planner per hour unless you have a really specific need and you know it's going to be limited and you feel like you don't need a full plan because that fee will start to add up quite quickly. Another model that I've been seeing recently, which I like is a subscription model. Instead of paying a big, fee up front, you may be charged monthly. The reason why I like that fee is because you're invested longer with a subscription fee as from a client's perspective and a planner's perspective. If you know you're paying for something on a monthly basis, it, it persuades you to be more interactive with your planner and to reach out to them when you have a question. And also the, the planner is incentivized to work with you and to answer those questions going forward. When you have a flat fee situation, you already paid them, they delivered the plan. There's not much incentive to continue to help you without you paying again. AUM fees are a percentage which you pay every for every year that you have this portfolio invested. If the advisor is also a planner, they may charge you a, a fee for the financial plan delivery because that's a different set of work that they'd have to do. If there is insurance, any type of insurance being implemented, that person is being compensated by the insurance company on a commission basis. And then there may be subscription models which work well for folks with less assets. Then there's the hourly fee. So this all may seem really confusing because there's a lot of options. But I do want to open it up that if anyone has any questions about these fees or if they're presented 
with the proposal from a planner, I could certainly explain it to you. But what you want is to have a relationship where the planner is incentivized to help you and to be available to you. And you in turn are invested in this relationship as well and, and do reach out to them, especially if you're paid. Uh, Tanya, thank you very much uh, for that description. Um, and uh, helps us differentiate financial advisors versus RIAs. It's actually a new term yeah. to me. Question, um, these fees, whether it be the, the flat fees or the AUM, do uh -huh. they offset capital gains or do they carry over as operating loss in future years? They no, they're just the fee. It's just that they have nothing to do with your capital gains. It's the fee. I believe there are ways if you do itemized deductions, the same way if you pay an attorney, it may be an itemized deduction that fee, but it just depends on how you're being charged that fee. The AUM fee, you're not cutting that check. So it's really hard to say to the IRS, I paid this fee. Um, even if you wanna submit statements, cause you don't get a statement per se for that fee. When you pay the planner up front for a plan, that's a fee that you could probably justify it when it comes to a taxable a, a deduction, the same way you're if you have your own business and you paid an attorney um, and you have those fees to deduct, you could do that, but it won't do anything for your capital gains at all. It won't help you in that area of your taxes. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Just for the compound interest, it's you, you don't realize how even the one percent assets under management fee really adds up over the long term. And you're right, since they don't send you statements, I, I hope my math's correct, but I just plug this into the compound interest calculator here. Like since the 401k contribution limits, like 22,500 for most, we're, we're talking about early career physicians. So if you start with mm -hmm. zero and add 18,000 sorry, uh, 1,850 each month so that you get to the 22,500 each year. And then I'm just assuming a 30 year career, 1%, I put interest rate instead of the fee, but it's funny. Yes, this isn't accounting for any of the gains that you're going to have. Cause I'm just trying to see what the approximate fee is, but it's funny. Like you've contributed 666,000 over 30 years by putting in 22,500 each year and the future value 1% up is like a hundred grand more. So I, I don't know if I did the math wrong, but that seems like a 1% AUM over 30 years, as you keep contributing money, it like comes to a hundred thousand dollars. I don't know. I've seen like pretty big figures, but I've never plugged it into a calculator before. I don't know. Yeah, I, right about that, that, I think so. That, 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 yeah, it, it, the math is right. The projection is wrong. So that's a linear yeah. going up in one direction investments don't work that way so the thing about that percentage yeah. some people like it because they feel like the advisor is benefiting for the account doing well obviously the account grows from a dollar's perspective they get paid more the thing is that if the planner is not doing anything other than implementing this portfolio for you then what are you paying for that's the thing the yeah. fee itself is not a huge problem. The problem is, are you actually getting value from this relationship and this planner for this fee? And if you feel like you're not, then the fee is not justifiable. But if this person is really helping you, answers all your questions, gives you the right action so that you can implement the plan, helps you stay invested, which is probably the biggest job any planner or advisor has, if you feel like they're actually giving you value, then you're not going to care too much about the fee. But if you're paying fees and other than the first time you met this person and they put the portfolio together and you never have a conversation with them ever again, then you're going to be like, but what am I paying for? In those cases, yes, it's going to be a problem. Planners and advisors have to make a living. This is why I like flat fee planners because you know exactly what you're getting or the subscription plans because I tend to like relationships where you are paying for the advice. The investment, you could invest on your own. That's reality. The way I see the value in a planner and client relationship is the advice. And is this person um, helping you through these life events? And can you trust this person um, and reach out to them when you need help when it comes to your finances and all the different decisions that you have to make in terms of your financial life? I took some 
notes based on last time's conversation at a comprehensive financial plan. I said the wrong term before financial advisor when we were talking about comprehensive financial planning. So part of that is going to be a lot of these things, right? Um, if you have student mm -hmm. loans, they go over with some student loan payment optimizing strategy with you. The spending plan, that's almost like budgeting and or cash flow management. Mm -hmm. And then investing, retirement, what we were talking about with 401ks, IRAs, and then if you have any money left over, which depending on your life circumstance, it's hard to reach what the textbooks talk about a lot of the times, like the 20% gross. A lot of people, I feel like that are physicians with high student debt, starting young families, trying to buy a house. Not that you have to do any of that. Those people that do choose to do that struggle to, to create brokerage accounts, you know, until many years into practice. But the one thing I forgot about our conversation a few weeks ago, does a comprehensive financial plan also include asset protection or no? Is that something that you have to talk to like, so I, I know to implement you it, you have to get like, a lawyer, but, oh, am I breaking up? Just a little bit, but keep talking. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. There's a lot of interest from the physician community about rental properties right now. I feel like a lot of the old school people that own rental properties, like parents and grandparents, they might just have checks coming in their own name. And now I see some younger physicians are all opening LLCs to try to create some sort of protected veil between themselves and the rental property. Like, did, yes, did financial planners go over any, asset? I, yeah. So, is, is there all, anything, anything I missed on that screen also? Yeah, it's actually a lot more than that. Think about it when you're about to get married, I, I when you it. have children, divorce, adoption, long term care for your parents. A lot of us are in san sandwich generations where we are taking care of kids and parents as well. Think about all the financial decisions you've made in your life since you finished medical school. And imagine if you had someone to bounce those ideas off of and help you make the right decisions when it comes to your finances. It's tons. It's also when you switch um, jobs, it's also when you have open enrollment, if you're a W-2 employee and you have benefits, um, when you take on a business and structuring that business the right way, if you have employees, it's a lot, it's an exhaustive list, but if it has anything to do with you deciding to do or not do something, if, if you're making this decision because you want to build wealth or you want to protect yourself, it's probably a conversation you want to have with your planner. I think sometimes people don't know when to reach out to their planner. They think, oh, if my, if I have some extra money to invest, I'll talk to this person. It's not just that. It's also the decisions that you make that don't have to do with you cutting a check. It's all of the life investment decisions. When your kids go off to college, what is the best way to cover those, you know, their tuition and their expenses? I have this conversation. I've had that conversation many times. It seems like parents really these days want to pay for their kids to go to school full boat. They will borrow for it. They will take money out of their retirement accounts for it. Having the pros and cons conversation of where this money is come from, coming from is super important. So there's tons of reasons why you would talk to your planner and it would include all these things. Now, if you're doing something like an estate plan, the planner can go through what you're trying to accomplish with this estate plan, meaning where do you want your assets to go and to who and when and how, they can walk through those steps with you, but they can, unless they're an attorney, they cannot implement a financial plan, estate plan for you. Only an, a, an attorney can draw up a will or a trust. There are services like trust and will that allow you to do it online. Those are super helpful if you have a simple situation before more complicated situations, you would need an attorney. There's also a lot of special needs families that have to be very careful about how they implement their finances and their estate plan so that they don't jeopardize the services that their dependents are, are getting. That's the whole other thing. But yes, anything having to do with your finances or life changes, transitions, 
school, career, children, marriage, divorce, death, taking care of your parents, things like that. All of that you can talk to your partner about. So it sounds like for the people that are early in their career, like residents just transitioning to becoming an attending or early career attending physicians that are interested in getting one, it, it really pays to have an ongoing relationship rather than a one and done because even the, because life circumstances oh, yeah. change, right? It's fluid. Typically, if you're on some sort of model where it's subscription, I'm just using that as an example, like how often do you think like an appropriate check-in is, is it quarterly? Is it twice a year? It's definitely not once a year, right? That's just, that's not very proactive. Once a year is just maintenance. Yeah. Once a year is just maintenance. Usually let's say these subscription plans, which I've seen popping up all over with planners that are looking to help people build wealth. I like those plans a lot. In the beginning, you'll probably meet with that planner pretty often. It might be at least once a month or a couple times that first month because you're getting things. After that, depending on what you're working on, if it's a cash flow situation, you're probably going to meet with that planner once a month. After that, semi-annually would be fine or just when you're having some sort of life event. The the time of year that I think it's super important for people to meet with their planner or advisor is usually around open enrollment because you're making a lot of benefits decisions and your planner will want you to leverage whatever benefits you have available to you as much as possible. Making those right decisions will be important. And any other time that you're having some sort of a life event or just have a question, reach out to the planner and ask if they should be able to help you. And what I would say though, don't expect like a change in your financial plan each and every time you speak to them. Cause unless it's a big life event, you want to stay on track, but if you have questions, definitely reach out to the planner. And if you're reaching out to your planner and they don't want to talk to you, or they don't seem to be available as often as you'd like, then obviously maybe not the right planner for you, but minimum, if you're on maintenance once a year, um, but what happens over time in my career, in the beginning, clients are super involved. They want to talk to you all the time. And then I don't, you know, they don't want to talk to me <laughs> after about the second year. But unless something's going on, they're not that interested in talking to their planner as much. And it'll probably get on to a once a year cadence unless something's going on. Then definitely reach out to your planner more often. But quarterly is probably too much semi-annual may be too much depending on where you're at in your financial plan, but definitely reach out if something's going on. Um, and your planner for sure should be reaching out to you at least once a year to review and see where you're at. We have a couple of medical advisory board members. I don't know if Ricky is available to talk, Dr. Rosella, but he, I guess you had made a written financial plan like a couple of years ago in 2020. I guess you, you made that after you took a course and then they provided a worksheet and you made one. But I'm just wondering if you've updated your written plan since then by yourself or do you work with someone or you haven't touched it since you made the plan? It's only been like two or three years. I don't know if he's available. Ricky, uh, hi. Yeah, actually, I've proved myself, man. <laughs> God, your hair always looks great, man. Yeah, <laughs> Tanya, yeah, definitely. I, I got screwed. By a high school buddy that worked for Northwestern Mutual. He yeah. sold people life insurance and all that. But now I have a written financial plan. I, I did that white coat investor course, which is awesome. I don't know if you know it, but does the sort of financial plan that you come up with your clients sort of align with the white coat investor does, like low cost index funds, getting away from commission products, but also focusing not only in just the an IPS portion of your financial plan, like the investment policy statement, but also a student loan plan. I think we mentioned the housing plan, also a budget. Is that what you do for clients? Usually, yeah, that all those pieces are components to a full financial plan. The student loan plan is super important, especially for physicians or anyone who's in a profession where they get out of school and usually have a lot of student loans. The investment policy statement is something that 
when you work with a CFP in particular, so a certified financial planner who's a fiduciary by default, you are most likely to get an investment policy statement. And that helps in the type of situations that Dr. Verma was talking about when he was speaking to a family member and it turned out they were in this really super conservative portfolio, the IPS will spell all that out. Because what you're saying is, this is the type of investments I am agreeing to participate in. And this is why, because the IPS will say that you're investing in this portfolio because you have X, Y, Z goals. So the IPS is super important not every financial advisor is going to offer you an IPS. They're probably not a planner to begin with, or certified, certainly not a certified financial planner. But all those things that you discussed are included in a comprehensive financial plan for sure. Yeah, it was disheartening, actually. My buddy who worked for Northwestern Mutual actually was a CFP. For Northwestern yeah. Mutual, which that, that's the thing is that the company itself is super important. Northwestern Mutual is an insurance company, first and foremost. Your buddy can't exist and work there unless he sells insurance. And first and foremost, it's his whole life. So insurance companies are insurance companies. You know that saying that when people show you who they are, believe them? Yes. An insurance company is going to sell you insurance. <laughs> they may have a CFP, but I would say if someone works for an a, RIA and or has their own practice as an RIA, you have a lot more faith in the fact that they're essentially able to implement a plan, investments, insurance, which they may not even do, but they will give you advice and it's going to be pretty broad. Um, because they're not limited by whatever this organization's specific products or services. If someone works for Northwestern Mutual, they can only sell you Northwestern Mutual products when they make a plan, even if, they do, if they're doing planning, they could only put in products that they offer through that company. The same thing would be if it's Mass Mutual, Principal, all of these other, New York Life is another one. The big mutual companies at the end of the day, they want their folks to sell insurance. It's funny the, oh, yeah. I'm nice. oh, sorry. I was just going to say, it's funny how you brought that up because in medicine, if you work for a big healthcare system and you're taking care of a patient and you want to refer to them to a physician who can, who's actually an expert in that, but a physician is not part of your healthcare system, you'll actually be discouraged from referring out of your healthcare system. It actually discourages that practice and it discourages good practice of medicine, essentially corporate practice of medicine. Not surprising to see this behavior with insurance companies trying to advocate for only their products, yet coming off as an objective member in this financial aid planning. 100% is very similar. When I worked with Mass Mutual, I was a little bit different. I and mean, I wasn't an insurance agent. I was helping their folks implement financial planning in their practices they're licensed to sell insurance and they could do other things. You could even have and charge for financial plans at Mass Mutual, but you couldn't do all those things unless you met a quota when it came to insurance. And that person may be able to show you other insurance carriers, but they're not paid the same way. If you implement a policy for MetLife or North or Nationwide or something, they're, they're really incentivized to sell their insurance and whole life is the one that you're going to see more often than not. One of the reasons why I was very interested in joining and why is because I know what type of investments or insurance that get presented to physicians, especially early in their career. Most folks that you interact with, if you work at a hospital or an organization or even through your university or school, you're going to get a lot of people reaching out to you and they're usually insurance companies and they're going to try to sell you whole life and disability insurance because it's the product that pays them the most. There's also products that you need. You need the disability. You don't probably don't need whole life, but disability is that one thing that is super important for you guys to have. And the only recommendation I make when it comes to disability is especially for physicians, 
is to work with a company that gives you um, the heavy discounts for implementing a disability policy when you're a resident. It will help you later on. I've seen that. I've seen physicians not follow through on having disability insurance early and it gets very expensive as you get older. The companies that will reach out to you more often than not are insurance companies because they know that this is, these are things that you it will benefit you to get earlier, but they're probably not going to talk to you about investments or all these other things because they know you're not going to have enough money to invest with them. And they're just not interested in having those type of relationships. Also, all sorts of like nuances with buying disability insurance as well, like with whether it's like own occupation or the correct amounts, yep. and whether you have riders built in to be able to increase it later on. Yep whether you pay for it with pre-tax dollars or post-tax dollars, there's all sorts of stuff. And yep. unfortunately, a lot of people get get into a bad situation because they find they purchase the one that's offered to them by the salesman. And then un unfortunately, some something can happen in life and you can develop a pre-existing condition and not be able to buy the right one that you should have had in the first place. Yeah, there's a lot of unknown unknowns. Unfortunately, 100% but. disability insurance is one thing that I do recommend that you get like a disability insurance specialist. There are insurance folks that focus just on that and really know what they're doing. A general, I guess in your field too, a general practitioner is going to work for everything, but in the insurance space, working with someone, and it may not be your planner, because a lot of planners these days won't accept commissions and they're not licensed to sell insurance. They, just, they will just tell you that you need disability insurance. They might partner with someone who does it, but they may not be implementing it for you. Most planners that I know that are really good at what they do, they'll work with a disability insurance specialist. Who that, that's all that they do. And they are very well aware of the different types of policies and why they work for you. A lot of them will be well versed in the hospital that you work in because sometimes the hospitals have discounts for disability insurance with different insurance carriers. Those folks definitely know what they're doing when it comes to disability insurance. But just like any other thing, that they'll be great at that, but not at other things. Um, but your planner is almost like so the person that puts it all together for you, and they should be able to connect you with someone. Do you, do you uh, tell you have a list of trusted disability insurance guys that, that will sell through one occupation and, and all that? Or, or is it something like you, you actually can't really have an affiliation with some of those to sell disability? We're working on these lists, not only for insurance providers, but also for planners, just to vet some folks. We really take it seriously. We don't want to put someone on there that we don't trust. We have to go through a process to ensure that we're comfortable sending you to them. That's something that I'm working on now. If you needed something sooner than later, just reach out to me directly and I'll help you. Yeah, yeah I, I've just really gone through the white coat investor, but uh, I don't know if you know anything about you know, that recommended list and if it's something that you have some fault with. Oh, wait a minute. You know, some of these guys might not be. It seemed like the material there or the the referrals, even though they're paid to be uh, there or advertised in the White Coat Invested website, they seem pretty fiduciary or they sell only true on occupation. I don't know if you, you've taken a look. Yeah, I have. Yeah, yeah. And that what I like about what they've done on that side is that they actually separate the insurance from the planners, which is super important to do. They yeah. also put the questionnaire on the website that these folks fill out in order to be on the website. There are just some questions there that I know no planner would answer truthfully on paper. So I'd rather go through an interview process with people before we put them on the website. Also, like I actually yeah, uh, and the, reported the other... my, um, my buddy to the CFP board for selling whole life insurance. I, I didn't think anything really happened to him. Is there anything where the CFP sort of is anything punitive to Oh, um, yeah. Because it just didn't happen. And they, it seems the CFP just continues to let you work at Northwestern Mutual and sell whole life. You can't look at the CFP board and still trust that they're actually sanctioned the people that are selling whole life insurance. It seems like they may only 
put them on the website if they did something totally egregious, like actual stealing or commit a crime. But if it's not a crime, like selling whole life, it seems like you keep your CFP designation. Has that been your experience? Um, yeah, the with, C yeah. I've had my CFP for 16 years. I have a love-hate relationship with my designation. <laughs> it was a lot of work to get it. And the CFP board is a professional organization that has very limited power. They can't stop someone from working. The organization that could have helped you or even stopped someone from doing something like, I guess in your case, saying that this person sold you something that was inappropriate, you would have to take that up with Northwestern Mutual or the state. Insurance people are licensed per state. If you had a complaint, you probably should have taken it to the insurance, to the board, the insurance board for that state. The CFP organization is not the SEC. They cannot stop someone from being licensed. The CFP is just the designation. Now they are very strict when it comes to certain areas and they will publicly sanction people or take the letters away. That's about as much as they can do. They can just say, you can't use these letters anymore. I can't say you're a CFP. That's the ultimate penalty. Um, but the CFP board works with a lot of financial organizations. They actually pay the CFP board, the Northwestern Mutual being an insurance company probably pays the CFP board annually for a whole bunch of situations, whether it be for conferences, things like that. Every financial organization contributes to the CFP organization. Usually the best course of action is to actually speak to the organization that licenses the person and not the CFP board. The CFP just means that you've gone through all this extensive training to be a certified financial planner. And yes, that you act as a fiduciary. But the other thing that it requires you to do is to make disclosures. And usually they're written. And if you didn't read it, it doesn't mean they didn't give it to you. Sometimes that's the gray area when it comes to the CFP board. Because they are certified so financial planners. I, I think... that, so the CFP, they have planners on there that get paid all those different ways that I explained to you. So the CFP board doesn't dictate how someone gets compensated. What they do require you to do is to disclose it. Okay. Dr. Ram is having trouble with internet. Did anyone have any additional questions? I know there's some, there's some other areas we wanted to cover. Ricky, I have a question. Other than your friend, have you ever worked with a planner before? Or putting your plan together was your first exposure to a financial plan? Yeah, so I just did it myself. I did it only work with my buddy who, who screwed me and then, yeah, did it myself. I don't know if you went over this. Sorry, my son is nuts. Did, how do you assess risk tolerance, actually? Do you use a risk tolerance questionnaire or do you have your own way after your interview to see, like, the amount of stocks and bonds you should be? Does your risk capacity come in, in, in play with you where if you have less working years, your risk capacity is down, maybe you should be more in bonds and less in stocks. How do you gauge that? Uh, everybody's different. What I usually do is we have the questionnaires, but the questionnaires, people don't really know what they're answering. In my days when I worked at JP Morgan or HSBC, which is, it was a requirement to fill out those questionnaires, obviously we would do that. But then from a planning perspective, if we're putting a plan together and I would take a look at how someone's invested currently, and take into account what they're trying to accomplish and when, if the numbers don't work, then we're gonna have a conversation as to what we can do to ensure that you do reach these goals. And sometimes that conversation has to do with your investment mix. It may mean that we have to change your allocation and what would that change in allocation mean? The reason why I do that is because if I say a moderate portfolio or even give someone a, a percentage of how much they're allocated in bonds or stocks, that, that doesn't mean much. You have to see what this could do in the long term for you to really understand why you're invested in this portfolio. To say that I just I don't want to lose money or I just want to make money is not enough when it comes to picking an investment because you have to stay invested. And it may mean that you may have a different allocation for your retirement accounts than you do for your taxable accounts. 
It may mean your kids 529 account may be invested differently. So there's a bunch of ways that I would go about it with a client. It's not just a questionnaire at all because I don't think those outcomes really work for people. That's one of the reasons why I like the investment policy statement because they can be pretty detailed as to how you're invested and why. Um, and I think I said this before, the most important thing is for you to stay invested. That's why at the end of the day, for most people, the, the best thing for them to do is invest in low cost um, exchange traded funds or low cost investments across the board because the way you make money over time and build wealth over time is by focusing on the decisions or the things in your financial life that you can control. It's very little to do with the investments. That's just one piece. So how much you contribute, how consistent you are with contributing, how you protect yourself, all these other things are much more important than the actual investment itself. Cool. Uh, do you, are you into the, like the factor tilting, like small cap value, or do you not really think you'd have to do the factors to accomplish your goals? You just stick this like a Bogleheads refund, like portfolio. How do you do that with factor investing or factor tilt? For some people that's appropriate. For a lot of people, it's, it's not even the main thing that we need to be focusing on. I think this is the difference between a financial planner and a financial advisor who focuses on investments. If your biggest concern is your student loan and paying off that debt, then how much time do we need to spend on the minuscule percentages in your investment account? Yeah, you should be diversified and invested in a low cost portfolio, but there's probably other areas that are more important and you focus on those first. But at the end of the day, being invested as diversified as possible is the best way in the long run. But for some people, especially people who are doing it on their own, they're probably just gonna buy the S&P 500 and maybe the MSCI, and they're not gonna go crazy. And they're probably gonna be fine. Speaking of which, the more behavior, have you ever talked clients off the cliff, maybe in 2008 or during the Corona bear, have you had those discussions where they're about to hit the sell button and you're like, no, like, how did you <laughs> like stop them? Did you like hide their password or something or tell them no, to hide their password? No, 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 you no, just no, talk no, them no. down or. <laughs> so it's funny that you mentioned that time frame. I had just transitioned from institutional money management, which is very different from working with people, individuals, when it comes to their investments, I had left, um, Merrill Lynch and went to HSBC right that smack in 2008, 2009. So it was a very scary time for clients. Yes, I have prevented people from selling out their portfolios, but not everyone. Some people, you just couldn't get them to not sell. And then I had people who came in with big checks and were like, I am buying everything that I can right now. And those folks did really well. Um, so it, it really depends. I have this one client, an older woman. She wasn't my client initially. She was someone else's and then she was given to me. She had purchased about half a million dollars of AIG bonds right before the government. Oh my failed. God. <laughs> you say, oh my God, but it was actually a great investment, right? Yeah. Because yeah. what ended up happening was the government basically infused them out. Yeah. with cash, bailed them out, and their bonds were essentially backed by the US government. It was the equivalent of having a treasury. Now, was, that was not reflected in the price itself. So a bond matures. All she had to do was hold it to maturity. This woman was sick with stress about the value of these bonds. There was one point that the bonds were worth 20%. She lost 80% of the value. The thing about your investments, when you get your statement, that's just, it's price. You haven't realized this gain or loss unless you sell, unless you sell it. That was one client that I went out of my way to talk to almost every single week to ensure that she did not sell those bonds because they never miss an interest payment. And when they matured, she got her money back. All she had to do was just not sell it. And I got her do that. And she stayed with, oh my gosh, she ended up being one of my clients all the way until I separated from my practice, which was, I think I met her in 2008, 2009. 
and I left my practice in 2021. So she stayed with me all those years. Oh, wow. Well done to get her to hold on. <laughs> yes, I just needed her to hold on, which is hard to do, right? This woman, she had just retired. She took all this money. Oh, yeah, yeah. She, and she lost about 80% of her portfolio when that happened, at least the value on the statement. But I just needed her to hold on, and, and she did. Then the clients that came in with big checks to invest did very well. They were buying all these stocks, every stock you could think of that was at single digits. $10, $3, they did really well in the long run. Yeah, it, it seems like a lot of those became financial bloggers and then they're like, oh, look at me, fire, financially independent. <laughs> there really were no young they people. Were they, were just, they were just lucky to invest in a good time. Yeah, the folks that were doing it were experienced investors, older people. I had no young people doing that. At least I didn't meet any. I remember 2008. 2009 was a different time from 2018 or 2019, that was a long time ago. But in experienced investors were coming in with big checks to invest and they did very well. But these are folks who have been investing for years and they were completely comfortable in going in when they did. And they held on to all those positions. How you handled like spouses that are not in the same financial page? Is that something where uh, you're used to a little financial therapy rather than uh, actual financial planning. Uh, I guess they're tied. Prior to coming into NYS, I had a startup that was a financial planning startup and it was a subscription model. And one thing I made sure was that even if it was a couple that we were charging the same fee. The reason why I did that is because in my experience, there were plenty of times that I would be working with one spouse and not the other for a bunch of reasons. Usually if there was an older couple, the wife was not as interested in the finances and felt that their husband was supposed to take care of these things. I would encourage them to bring their wives over, even if they didn't say anything, just so that they were there. Because I was a client facing planner for over 20 years. So I had a lot of clients pass away and it's not a good situation when the spouse doesn't know anything about their finances. I've had spouses who didn't even know how to pay their utility bills after their husband passed away. So I always encourage couples to participate in the process. And I've also had couples that participate and don't agree on anything at all. Um, and <laughs> that would be with me and my wife. <laughs> <laughs> there is a process for couples, excuse me, for financial planning that are in conflict. One of my planners at my previous company was trained in this, and this is one of the reasons why I hired him, because there is a process to go through to try to get couples to get on the same page. If it's extreme, for the most part, you will get couples that don't agree on everything, which is fine, but just finding some sort of a middle ground. Also, what I would do is just illustrate to them what the outcome would be based on either of their choices and usually let them decide after that. Because there's one thing if you say something and you want to make this financial decision, but you don't really know what the outcome of that is going to be. So usually showing them what the outcomes of these decisions will be helps because it's no longer, I'm not going to agree with you. It's more of, oh, does this make sense or not? But there's certainly a big need for financial therapists. There are a lot of people who need that. And it's usually because think about the way you think about money. All of our decisions and our feelings and thoughts about money have to do with the way you experienced money growing up. And if you've come from a place of lack, then you, you will make financial decisions. With those thoughts in mind, going forward as an adult, there are people who've gone through financial trauma whether it be through relationships and that will affect how they make their own financial decisions. Yes. <laughs> I haven't had extreme cases like that, but I usually try to illustrate to the couple what the effects would be of their decisions that usually helps them make decisions and trying to figure out what is it that's going to make one person happy. And if it doesn't make a huge difference in the financial plan, let them do it. I had a spouse once that said she wanted to spend $3,000 every Christmas and they could certainly afford to do that. It was not going to make or break them. Husband wasn't happy about it, but 
I just showed him that it matters with us. He got ten dollars for Christmas every year. Awesome, Tanya. Thanks. Have you had clients that are fired and like retired early, and but you had to do like seventy-two T and all that? Have you had clients where yeah, uh, with the with the fire, you have experience uh, with that? I I have feelings about fire. Usually, if someone is participating in the fire method, they're not working with a planner because the whole objective is to minimize expenses. They're usually doing it on their own, which makes sense if that's what you're trying to accomplish. Fire is not for everybody. And the reason why I say that is because the people that I know that have done it successfully have been able to lean on resources or family members so that they can do this. Not everybody has that situation. Not everybody has a parent or a family member that will allow them to live with them for X amount of years and not pay any bills. So that way they can save money. A lot of times these are circumstances of privilege when people do it and it works. But I also noticed that everyone who's doing fire and is at the retirement stage, they're technically not retired. What they've done is put themselves in a position where they do the things that they want to do as opposed to what they have to do. And sometimes those things include making money in a different way, which I would recommend for everybody, right? That's the point to get to a point of financial flexibility and independence where you start doing the things that you want to do. That may mean working on something where you do get paid to do it, but you were not in a position to make that decision before. Horror stories. Yeah. Yeah, sorry for kidding. Those are fun stories. Dr. Verma, did you want to wrap up? Let me see. I didn't even see the time. Oh yes, it's eight sixteen. Yeah, we should wrap up to for everyone watching this call. Tanya is very graciously offering free educational sessions, a complimentary sessions. If you go to our site on andwise.com and you go halfway down the page here. You can click on this and then her calendar link comes right up and you can click on a session right here. Yeah. Thanks everyone for joining. Thanks everyone. Okay. Awesome. Bye -bye. Thank you. Good night. Bye-bye. Thank you.